Yes, we can now too. Okay, <laughs> thank you. So like I mentioned just a second ago, we are doing this three week series on the six influencers of brain health. And these six influencers, exercise, diet, stress, cognitive fitness, sleep, and social connections um, have been proven through research and clinical studies and trials that these are really the best ways to influence a positive, healthy brain aging. <clears throat> so you can influence your brain health in a positive way. Um, we can also make different choices and influence our brain health in not su such a great way. And we're gonna talk about the, all of these over the next three weeks. Um, but knowing these do influence, for better or for worse, our brain health. I want to briefly talk, though, about what the causes of memory loss and confusion are. When we start to see signs in maybe ourselves or in our loved ones that there are some brain changes or things are just not the way they used to be, um, we can be concerned um, and maybe sometimes jump to conclusions that it is a progressive dementia like in Alzheimer's disease. Dementia, as it says here, is just an umbrella term, um, and it really is to describe a range of conditions or several different symptoms that you might see which can cause changes to the brain. There are progressive neurodegenerative dementias that we know of as Alzheimer's disease, vascular dementia, frontotemporal, Lewy bodies. There's a a list here, there's about 130 different types of progressive dementias that do start off with this range of, of symptoms that can be um, short-term memory loss or language difficulties, personality changes, um, having a hard time problem solving, just a difficult time doing things the way they used to as well. I mean, again, it is a wide range of symptoms also depending on what type of dementia it might be. But please know that Alzheimer's disease and these related dementias are not a normal part of aging. It's not that we get to a certain age and we start to see some um, brain changes or we're not thinking as quick as we used to or we're having more of those senior moments. That does not automatically mean that we have Alzheimer's disease or our loved ones have Alzheimer's disease or a related dementia because there are a number um, of other things that can cause confusion and memory loss that can be fixed or treated or managed very well. And this is just a list of those. Um, there can be other health conditions that somebody's living with that maybe they're not managing very well or they haven't been diagnosed with yet, <clears throat> like a heart condition um, or a diabetes, or they're having a lung problem or breathing issue that can cause some brain fog, um, some confusion, memory loss, language difficulties, <clears throat> you name it, excuse me. An infection or immune disorder, um, a metabolic dis uh, problem. So they're having some maybe nutritional deficiencies, maybe their eating habits have changed and poor eating habits, um, or they're just not getting the nutritional, like a vitamin B6 or B12. The body's not making it as well as it used to and they're not getting it through their diet. Um, and that can, be, that can be fixed, that can be treated. It can be side effects to medications. It can be lifestyle choices. Um, maybe they are abusing drugs and alcohol or they've been smoking most of their lives and starting to see some um, damage from that. Unmanaged stress is another one as well. Um, I know we talk to caregivers all the time, caregivers of persons with dementia that really get scared because they think they might have it as well. Um, but 99% of the time, it's not that they have a dementia, but they have some unmanaged stress that can cause some of those same symptoms that we see in a progressive dementia. And depression and anxiety, well, any unmanaged or untreated depression and anxiety can cause the same symptoms. And we talk about this and I always bring it up as much as I can because I think Alzheimer's disease and these related dementias, I think they are the world's most feared disease and rightly so. Um, but it's also, we gotta we kind of take a deep breath and say, okay, I might be noticing some changes and I may not like them, but I don't wanna to jump to conclusions and automatically think me or my loved one have this progressive disease because there are a number of things that we do have a lot of influence over and a lot of things that, we, that can be fixed or treated that can help clear up possibly some of the brain fog or senior moments. In saying that though, you also have to get a very um, thorough and proper diagnosis. 
So you want to make sure you're seeing a trusted doctor or team of doctors that can look at you as a whole person or look at your loved one as a whole person and they're experts, maybe a geriatrician, neuropsychologist, neuroscientist, neurologist, excuse me, um, as part of that team that can look at everything and really get down to the root cause of what's causing those symptoms that you're having so we can put you on the right treatment plan get you that right diagnosis. And we wanna know the risk factors for this too. So with those progressive dementias, your Alzheimer's, vascular, Lewy body dementias, um, our number one risk factor for those is age. And the older we get, the higher our risk factor is. And we can't stop the aging process yet. I think they're trying, but they haven't gotten there yet. So we are more susceptible to it. But again, it does not mean it's a normal part of aging. Um, our family, there are some genetic um, components that have been identified with several of the dementias, Alzheimer's, um, frontotemporal, Lewy body. Um, but those genetic components generally are just a risk factor. They're not deterministic. So they might increase your risk a little bit if you see it in a parent or a sibling. But again, it's not deterministic. A mild cognitive impairment is a diagnosis that somebody might get that they are having some changes in one area of the brain. If I backtrack a little bit with dementia, you have to have at least two brain, um, brain functions that are changing or you're seeing changes in two different brain areas. So it can be short-term memory loss or memory issues, but also a language problem or memory issues and personality changes. So there's gotta be two things um, kind of happening, changes happening in the brain. With mild cognitive impairment, what people are seeing is maybe some abnormal memory loss as they're getting older, but there's not another brain change happening, not, an, not another brain function that's being affected. About 40 to 50% of those individuals diagnosed with mild cognitive impairment do go on to develop um, a progressive dementia, so they start seeing other areas of the brain affected. But the other half um, will stay and they'll maintain where they're at. So they're just dealing with that one brain change. Somebody that has um, some trauma to the brain, um, you know, most of the time we can't um, change that if it's already, it's been a past trauma and we want to practice safe, safety, you know, throughout our entire lives. And then individuals with Down syndrome, um, they're showing that if the individual lives long enough with Down syndrome, they're seeing the same brain changes as somebody with Alzheimer's disease. So they're doing some studies on those individuals as well. So it is being aware of what our risk factors are. So those risk factors, we don't have, we can't change those, right? As much as we might wanna try. But these risk factors that we see, um, we do have influence over these. So these really do increase our risk quite a bit for a progressive dementia like Alzheimer's disease. Abusing drugs and alcohol, um, smoking, atherosclerosis, that's, um, Clogged arteries, you know, the, um, the plaques that build up in your arteries. Um, high or low um, untreated blood pressure, particularly high blood pressure. Um, that LDL cholesterol, that's that lousy cholesterol. So if we have high levels of that um, in our bodies, high homocysteine, head injuries. Again, we want to be safe throughout the course of our lives. Unmanaged and untreated depression throughout the course of our lives as well. This chronic stress that we don't manage. Um, we don't uh, deal with very well or ignore it possibly. Um, if we're obese or overweight, I think underweight needs to be on there too if we're malnourished or have some of those issues. And diabetes, these are all known risk factors, but all of these risk factors we do have some influence over. So it is being very aware of what are our risk factors because we do have influence. Um, real quick, just some quick brain facts. Um, to make sure we understand that our brain is a very greedy organ, if you will. It weighs about three pounds, um, but it consumes 25% of our oxygen. So one in every four breaths that we take, all that oxygen goes straight to our brain. It consumes 25% of the nutrients that we feed our bodies with, about 70% of glucose, 60% um, of the brain is fat. So it's our fattest organ. <clears throat> And then each one of our neurons, so our brain has about 100 billion neurons in it. And each one of those 100 billion neurons has, it can have up to 10,000 connections with other neurons throughout the brain. And I have this, I'm gonna read this to you. But each neuron may be connected up to, to 10,000 other neurons, passing signals to each other 
um, via synaptic connection. So kind of like an electrical current is how they communicate with each other. But these 10,000 connections, possible 10,000 connections, passing signals to other neurons um, via as many 1,000 trillion synaptic connections. This is equivalent by some estimates to a computer with a 1 trillion bit per second processor. I'm not entirely sure I know what that means, but I know it's really, really fast. <laughs> I tried to look it up, like, what does that relate to? Um, but it's very, very fast. Our brains are amazing. 100% um, of our brain is used. We may not use 100% of it 100% of the time, because um, we know when we go to sleep, different parts of our brain turn on um, and do different things. But the brain is so incredibly resourceful. And over the course of our lifespan, we are always able to grow new connections between those neurons and strengthen connections between those neurons. We have a um, wonderful um, organ brain that we have been given, and we want to make sure we take good care of it because our brain controls absolutely everything that we do. Um, it does. It keeps uh, our, our heart beating. It keeps us to be able to move. But it's also our emotions. It's regulating body temperature. I mean, it does everything. And we want to make sure that organ that does everything is very healthy. So we have so we have this head heart connection. And the heart and the brain are directly connected. Um, a healthy brain um, also translates that you need to have a healthy diet. Um, because it helps your heart pump all the nutrients, that oxygen and those nutrients and that glucose um, that the brain needs for it to function optimally. So we have to be able to make sure our heart's working well to make sure our brain is working well. But it also strengthens our immune system. Um, it helps us reduce the stress response that our bodies go into. And next week, we're going to talk more about stress um, and how that can influence positive or negative to our brain health. It increases our energy. Um, but it also increases our resiliency, um, not just our physical resiliency, but also mental and emotional resiliency. And of course, it helps us reduce risk for other illnesses that we might possibly have. So talking really in depth more about the diet, I want to stress that if you change uh, or make any changes to your diet um, or incorporate supplements that we'll briefly cover, is really you want to talk to your doctor um, or consult with a trusted doctor. Because each person, each body is different, um, and each body is unique. What's going to work great for me may not work great for Holly, and vice versa. So we really want to work with our bodies and understand how they work um, in talking to your doctor about it. But we are going to talk about all these things, components of a healthy brain diet, which is also a healthy heart diet. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the Mediterranean Mind Diet. We'll talk a little bit about supplements and vitamins and then those brain draining foods that we really want to avoid. And the question is, do you eat to live or do you live to eat? Um, and, you know, I would say both <laughs> for me personally, both, um, particularly at times, right? But let food be thy medicine and medicine be thy food. Time and time again, I've heard story after story after story of somebody that has reversed diabetes or pre-diabetes just through their diet. Um, they've recovered from cancer um, way faster through a healthy diet, changing their diet. Um, reduce body inflammation through changes in their diet. So it is important to view food as it's how we live, but it's also a medicine for our bodies, physically, but mentally and emotionally as well. So a diet should include omega-3s, these fatty acids, and we're going to talk more about how do you get omega-3s, um, antioxidants, we'll talk about more, um, but more about those, but leafy greens. So these are um, leafy greens. And really, the, a lot of studies now, more, more particularly now, they're showing that plant-based plant diets really do contain all the nutrients a body needs. When you have that plant-based diet, you're obviously getting a lot more leafy greens and whole grains and vegetables in your diet as well. Um, but it also has just as much, if not more, protein um, than a meat diet. And th these studies are coming out just, we're, I don't think we're aware as how many plants and greens and whole grains have so much protein in them. Um, and they're also, they have all the nutrients and trace minerals that the body absolutely needs. Um, so current studies, they're looking at plant-based diets are the best for heart and brain health. 
you also get healthier fats. So in general, healthy fats, so those um, polysaturated and monosaturated fats um, come from plants, and those are generally healthier than fats we get from animals, which can contain higher cholesterol. Um, or you wanna do lean meats, like your poultry, your fish, um, bird, something like that. Nuts, avocados, fatty fish, your salmon and tuna, seeds, olive oils, beans, these all have those healthy fats in them. Um, they also have a lot of protein in them as well. So berries, you wanna make sure your diet includes lots of berries. And notice I don't have fruits up there. While fruits, you wanna make sure your diet has a lot of fruit, but berries is that important part of, or a better fruit, I guess, to choose from. Um, because they contain flavonoids that improve um, cognition. And the flavonoids is what gives it that color. Um, that, you know, the blueberries and raspberries and cherries, they have that deep color. And that comes from the flavonoids, which can be brain protective. And then just adding to your diet, more color and more variety. But we wanna make sure it's natural color. Um, these are, you know, you got purple eggplants, you got orange carrots, you also got purple carrots, you got um, zucchinis, the squash, the mushrooms, parsnips, all the colors um, across the rainbow that occur naturally in foods. Not processed colors like your Cheetos and your Twinkies and all that stuff. Those are very colorful, but that's not the color we're going for. So color and variety. Um, variety is also a key. And getting more fiber in your diet, your body is able to metabolize and process and break down the food better when you have the fiber. Um, and you can get fiber from whole grains, fruits, leafy greens, I have up here how much is suggested. This is a general suggestion. Again, you want to talk to your doctor about how much you need um, for men and women. And then more fluids. Um, and this is add more water into the day. If you can eat, at least add one glass of water um, into the day or fruit juices, um, vegetable juices. I do want, I want to say when you're looking at juices, watch the sugar content. And we're going to talk about sugar some more because we do want to make sure we're avoiding um, processed sugar or added sugar. Um, into our diets, um, reducing alcohol, and possibly caffeine. So there's on there, those little stars as an asterisk, there have been several studies to show that caffeine can be protective against the brain. Um, some studies show that say you want to reduce caffeine. However, I think a lot of it is how much caffeine your body, your particular body needs. Also, what time of the day are you getting caffeine? You might want to cut that off at noon you know, um, cause it can keep us awake longer. And then what are you adding? You know, I think caffeine, I think coffee. Well, what are you adding to that coffee? That's going to offset the benefits of the caffeine. Cause if you're adding a bunch of sugar and cream and stuff, then that's, then we do want to avoid that. So the omega threes, um, all omegas. So we have three omega three, six, and nine, all omegas are very, very important. What they're saying for that brain healthy diet is omega three, um, is what helps decrease inflammation, um, but it also helps the brain development and brain function. With omega-3s, what we're showing or what their studies are saying is that it is an essential fat. An essential fat means our bodies don't make it naturally, so we get it through our diet. Well, the modern Western diet typically does not contain enough omega-3s. Now, omega-3s generally are um, you know, you think of those fatty fish where you get it from um, through sardines or that's uh, salmon or tuna is where you can get those. Um, but we're just knowing that the diet may not contain enough omega-3. So how can I incorporate more omega-3s into my diet? Um, again, we'll talk about those supplements here in a second because you can add a supplement. Um, with omega-3s, it talks about the EPA or the DHA. The EPA does help reduce inflammation is what they're showing, but the DHA um, helps make up 8% of that brain weight. And remember the brain's one of the fattest organs, so it needs some of the healthy fat to, for it to function optimally. Um, and it's important for brain development and function. It can also help um, with our liver function and support mental health, heart health and bone health. Omega-6s are also an essential fat, meaning we need to get it through our diet. Um, it's good for us. Um, but now, I will say, though, if you have too many or if you have too many produced within your body, it can increase inflammation. So you want to strike a healthy balance, and that is talking to your doctor. But most of the time, the typical modern Western diet contains plenty of omega-6s. 
And then omega-9 is a, um, a non-essential fat means that our bodies produce it naturally. So it's the most abundant omega that's in our cells and generally we have plenty. But remember all omegas are important. It's just the omega-3s, they're showing a lot more for brain health. And then we have the antioxidants. And if you break down the word antioxidant, so anti means against, and oxidants is oxidation. So antioxidants are against oxidation. And our cells and our molecules within our brain and our body, they kind of create waste as the day go on. As they're working hard, um, they can kind of create waste. And sometimes that waste can be unstable and it can be called or become float throughout our brains and through our bodies and call it, be called a free radical. Um, and these do can become damaging if they're not processed out of our system properly. So we do have our bodies that make natural antioxidants, um, but you can also get antioxidants from the outside and put them in um, through your diet and through exercise as well. But these antioxidants really, they kind of act as the trash men. Um, so they go in, they clean up any free radicals or any of that maybe rust that's built up through the day or any extra waste. Uh, before it becomes damaging and it gets it out of our system. A lot of times this happens at night, particularly in our brain. Um, it comes in, it helps clean out that waste and it gets um, dumped out through our spinal, uh, our spinal fluid. Most antioxidants that you're getting from the outside, you want to get through vitamin C's, vitamin D, vitamin A, um, beta carotene and lycopene. So beta carotene, you get a lot in carrots, lycopene a lot in tomatoes. But those are really those antioxidants that you can put in your body from the outside to help flush the waste out. You can also get them in berries, dark chocolate, pecans, beans, artichokes. Again, it's that all those plant-based um, foods that we have to help get our body, um, get the waste out of our body and our brains. The Mediterranean diet, and you may have heard of this already, the Mediterranean diet is... Um, been shown over and over again that it can dramatically reduce your risk for Alzheimer's disease because it is very pro um, healthy foods, um, but also limiting on the unhealthy foods. So it is a primarily plant based diet and you can see the food um, pyramid here. What I really like about this one particularly because we're going to talk about it here in a second is that that daily physical exercise, make sure you're moving um, every day, but then you have those whole grains. Um, pastas, quinoas, other grains, and then you got your vegetables, your nuts, your fruits, and then you have cheese, yogurt, olive oil. So you're cooking more with olive oils um, and as opposed to butters or margarines or using more of them as a um, dressing. You got cheese and yogurt, you got your lean meats up there. So fish, seafood, poultry, um, eggs, you got sweets, and then meat. It says if you're going to eat red meat, um, do it about monthly. So it has on there daily, you wanna get all these food groups in. Um, these are your brain healthy, heart healthy food groups. Weekly, you wanna add this stuff in, then monthly, if you gotta do it, have this. It's also got on there water um, and wine in moderation. So with alcohol, there are a lot of studies that show particularly wine can have some brain protective um, derivatives to it, I think particularly because it's made with those grapes. But it is all about moderation. So for women, it is one glass a day, one six ounce pour. Um, and for men, it's two glasses a day. We will say, if you don't drink, don't start. That's, that's not what we're saying here, but if you are drinking, just limit it to um, that recommended daily amount because we don't wanna go over and offset any positive effects. And then there's the mind diet. Um, this is, let's take that, high, that Mediterranean diet and the DASH diet. The DASH diet is the dietary approaches to stop hypertension. And they've combined those to make this hybrid diet of the MIND diet. Um, all three of these diets, the Mediterranean, the di uh, DASH, and the MIND, um, really show that they reduce your cardiovascular um, conditions. So they're really good for your heart, which in turn, they're automatically good for your brain. Um, depending on how much you adhere um, or how strict you are about the diet, you can reduce your risk for Alzheimer's disease as much as 53% um, using the MIND diet. Um, or those that just maybe were a little bit strict about it, moderately adhered to the diet, um, benefited about 35% of reducing your risk for Alzheimer's and other related dementias. 
This one can be a little bit easier people, for people to follow because this says there's 10 healthy food groups that you wanna get every day. Um, and it's listed here, it's the leafy greens, the nuts, beans, fish, olive oil, vegetables, whole grains, um, lean meat, that poultry, wine, if you're already using that. Um, but then limit these five unhealthy food groups, either limit or avoid completely. Um, so this is butter or stick margarine, um, cheeses, red meats, um, sweets, those added sweets, processed sweets, pastries, and then anything fried or fast food. So some people say, yeah, I can do, I can avoid these five and incorporate these 10 every day. Sometimes it's a little bit easier to follow, um, but a lot of studies on how beneficial they are. So quickly about the supplements. With supplements, a few things to note. Talk to your doctor before you add in any supplements or a pharmacist um, or both. You want to talk to both of them. They are not, the supplement industry, vitamin generally industry is not a regulated industry. Um, so you really want to talk to, make sure you're buying from a reputable source, um, that they're not adding in a bunch of fillers into the supplement. So talking to your doctor about which one you recommend, do you have a a brand or a source you recommend, and then also following up with the pharmacist because they might have some good information about that too. But knowing that supplements are not gonna work as well as getting these vitamins, minerals, trace minerals, nutrients, in as you would through your diet. <clears throat> Our bodies metabolize um, supplements or pills differently than it does a diet. So it says it's bioavailable. Our body knows how to process it when it comes through a diet or comes through our food as opposed to coming through a pill. Um, most of the time, the body will flush most of it out. Um, so you're just not getting as much of it um, through a pill as you would your diet. Folic acid though, however, is a supplement and we put it on here that you can get tested for it. You can ask your doctor about it. Is this even something they need to look into? Um, but it has been shown to be essential for brain and emotional health. Um, it's a component of our DNA and our RNA and it can help us with um, brain cells in our, our central nervous system. But it's been shown that it has effects on the production of those neurotransmitters or that um, synapses, it's those neurons talking to each other through that electrical current, and it kind of helps the production of those. It can also help predict against that oxidative stress or that oxidative damage. We talked about those antioxidants, we wanna add those to our diets. Folic acid can help um, kind of act as an, ox an antioxidant as well. They've seen people that had low folic acid in their, um, in their system associated with depression, also had sleep issues, had some reported confusion, hepatite loss, uh, nausea and seizures. So you can get this through your diet as opposed to supplement through your dark leafy greens, spinach, kale, um, chickpeas, pinto beans, avocados, whole grains. Vitamins B6 and B12 are um, really essential for normal brain health, for development, um, but also functioning as we age. Deficiencies in vitamins B or B vitamins have been linked to higher homocysteine levels. Um, and it's more common for an older adult to be deficient in B6 or B12. Now I said it's more common, it's not necessarily common for people 65 and older to be deficient, but it's more common because our body just doesn't produce it as well or metabolize it, metabolize it as well as it used to. You can buy or find B6 in chickpeas, um, beef liver, if you wanna try that, tuna or salmon, um, those lean, uh, lean meats, and anything that's fortified with it. Some cereals are fortified or oatmeals are fortified with it. And then B12 can be found, again, in fortified cereals or oatmeal, fish, fatty fish, milk, clams, things like that. Vitamin E has been shown. Um, now, it is one of the best ways to get that outside uh, antioxidants into the body, vitamin, eating foods with vitamin D. Um, but they've also been shown studies that people who ate a high vitamin E rich diet um, are 25% less less likely to develop dementia than those that had lower vitamin E intake. Mm -hmm. And you can find those in a lot of seeds, a lot of olive oils, um, nuts, you know, almonds, hazelnuts, cornel, broccoli, spinach, and then vitamin D. Um, there are more studies coming out with vitamin D in brain health um, and being deficient in vitamin D can increase your risk um, for some brain changes or some poor brain health. 
also with your cardiovascular health. You can get vitamin D through sun, uh, making sure you're getting plenty of sunlight, uh, but you can also get it in oily, fatty fish, eggs, mushrooms, it's plenty of things that we can put on our diet that in can increase our vitamin D levels. Again, with all of these, um, the supplements and the vitamins, you wanna to talk to your doctor. Does your body even need that? Or are you at good levels on all of those? And what would be, if you do need it, what would be the best way to incorporate that into your diet? And then our brain draining foods. So these are foods um, that have been shown over and over again that they're damaging to not only your brain, but to your heart, to your blood vessels, and can cause a lot of problems and a lot of damage um, to your brain, to your heart, to your arteries, um, and can lead to a lot of um, strokes and dementia. So we want to avoid added sugar. Naturally, or foods that have naturally occurring sugar, those are fine, that's, that's how they're meant to be. And our brain needs sugar. Um, we just want it to be natural sugar and not added sugar. Um, and this added sugar or processed sugar stimulates the reward center in our brain, so it can become addictive. Um, and it's, it's linked to diabetes, it's linked to poor brain health overall. Um, but know that also sugar, added sugar has a lot of, or several different names to it. It's not it's gonna might not necessarily be listed as sugar on the ingredients list, um, but anything that ends with or has glucose or fructose in the name, um, that's added sugar. And then it has, you know, um, sacrilege, sacrilege, oh, it's not coming to me. Uh, um, or I can't say sucralose, sucralose. Holly, what's the word? <laughs> um, I'm looking well, at it. Okay, thank you. I just can't pronounce it. Um, Are you well, talking about saccharin? Saccharin, thank you. Uh huh. Yeah. That's it. <laughs> thank you. Um, is list can be listed in that ingredient, but it's just another name for sugar. So being aware of all the names that sugar have. Um, and again, there's no reason to avoid sugar that's naturally processed. Again, you want to talk to your doctor and what's best for your body and what diet you're on, um, but it's this added sugar that's caused, causing the damage. And then they can be easily hidden um, in a lot of foods. So red meat um, is also something to avoid or limit quite a bit. Um, heavy creams, butters, cream cheese, whole milks, because those tend to be high in saturated fats, uh, fats and high in those lousy the LDL cholesterol. And they have shown links between high saturated um, fats and poor memory. And then anything that's refined or, um, you do, I need to scratch you enriched out of there. That's a typo, but it's refined. So when you have refined grains or refined pastas, um, that means that the, the process of it is stripped away the healthiest part of that pasta or that grain. So you're not getting anything healthy from from the process um, or from that food. And actually the um, scientists are saying the refining process creates an easy to digest food stuff. So they didn't even call it food, they called it food stuff um, that quickly absorbs in the bloodstream. So you get that um, sugar spike, um, but then you plummet and then you feel hungrier sooner um, and then you tend to be eating more anyway. It can also have a high uh, or a, a negative effect on your blood pressure. Um, and a um, high risk to linking to diabetes. So a couple of other trans fats, and generally, for the most part, our um, foods are not, don't contain trans fats anymore, um, but they use trans fat to increase shelf life of foods um, and those high processed stuff. So, but you wanna look for, uh, in 2018, a lot of these foods, they had to, trans fats had to be removed from most of our foods, but still look for some partially hydrogenated, hydrogenated oil um, or on the ingredients of anything. Because even if it says there's zero trans fat, um, you only have to list if half a gram or more. So they still might have some trans fat in it. It may not have any, um, the level might be so low that it may not have any effect, but it's just so we can be informed consumers. And then soda. Sodas are traditionally high in added sugars um, and high in artificial flavors and artificial colors, those dyes they put in it. And they can be, um, I mean, you're just adding all that sugar into your diet and then that artificial stuff into your diet, um, which is not good for your heart, um, your waistline, or your brain. 
And then diet sodas. If you, um, what they're showing is, is those um, artificial sweeteners. And the newer, or I should say the older artificial um, sugars, like saccharin, couldn't find the name the other day, or earlier aspartame, um, those, we know that there's some link to maybe an increased uh, inflammation in the body. So we know that these newer artificial sweeteners, the stevias that come for those monk fruits, um, they haven't been around as long. So we don't know the long-term side effects or how long the long-term effects of them. Um, but in general, they are thought to be more safe um, than your aspartame or saccharins that, are, that have been used in the past um, because they are more plant-based, but we still don't know a whole bunch. And then I think it's um, important just to say the amount of food um, that we're eating as well. Um, and particularly as we get older, our body doesn't need as much food. We still need the important nutrients, um, but we don't just need as much food because generally we're more sedative. Um, our, metabolize, our metabolism slows down a little bit. Um, so we don't need as much food just to sit down and eat as much food. I also think our culture, we eat more than we need anyway. Um, so downsizing to those smaller, maybe appetizer plates or snack plates, eating there, and then kind of waiting. It takes the brain about 20 minutes to um, realize that it's full. So we can be eating for an additional 20 minutes and it's already been full. So again, it's that 20 minutes. So you want to you know, eat a small portion and then sit for 20 minutes, 15 minutes, drink some water, and then see, am I really hungry? Do I really want to go back for more or eat some more? Give your brain that 20 minutes to kind of catch up. Um, to that metabolism, that system, and realize, am I full or am I not? So switching now to exercise. Um, and exercise is absolutely your brain's best friend. Just like with the diet, if you're going to start a new exercise regimen or anything like that, you want to make sure that you talk to a doctor about what that looks like, especially if you're living with a, um, a chronic illness or you've never really exercised before, whatever it is. Talk to that doctor um, before you start an exercise routine. And we always want to start, um, start slower and then build from there. But there are real cognitive benefits and immediate benefits to exercise. Some exercise is better than none. Um, so you don't say, well, I've never really exercised. Or I haven't been exercising in a long time. Why should I start now? It's not going to do anything. Well, that's not true. <laughs> so any exercise is better than none. And it also doesn't matter what age you start. You will see some cognitive benefits just have to start. Um, and it needs to be part of your long-term routine. Just like making good, healthy diet choices are part of just who you are, it's your lifestyle. An exercise routine just needs to be part of who you are and your lifestyle choices. So with physical activity, it has been shown that it increases the hippocampus volume and prefrontal cortex um, areas of your brain. So the hippocampus um, is the area of the brain that houses our short-term memory, and our ability to kind of learn new things. The hippocampus is the first um, area of the brain that Alzheimer's disease attacks. So if exercise can increase that hip, the volume of that hippocampus and make it stronger, then I absolutely want to do it. Same thing with this prefrontal cortex. Um, a lot of dimensions, this, the, this right here, the frontal lobe kind of starts to shrink a little bit. But if exercise helps me increase the volume of it and the strength of it, then I want to do that because it's going to offset any possible changes um, or slow down any possible changes that can come with a progressive dementia. Um, combining aerobics, so cardiovascular um, and strength training is better than, and, than any than doing one or the other alone. So if you're just doing cardiovascular or just doing strength training, you want to combine those because that's the best benefit. So if you want to make sure you're walking every day or gardening or whatever, but also add about two or three strength sessions into your weekly routine um, because it has been shown that it can cut your risk for Alzheimer's disease by half. So with exercise, so many benefits. It's increasing that blood flow. So it's getting your heart to pump and work harder to get that blood flow up to your brain. So you're getting that oxygen it needs. It's getting those nutrients that it needs. And it's also strengthening the cells, not only the brain cells, but the um, cardiovascular system um, uh, cells, blood vessels. It nourishes and fosters growth. Um, again, with the hippocampus, 
<clears throat> in the cerebellum and other regions of the brain. It's gonna lower your blood pressure. It's gonna reduce risk for other cardiovascular issues, diabetes. It also reduces your risk for cancers, particularly breast cancer and colon cancer. It's gonna help strengthen your muscles and your bones. Um, you're gonna feel stronger and you're gonna feel more confident on your feet and it decreases your risk for falls. And it increases this brain-derived neurotropic factor. And this is a molecule that encourages growth and strengthens neurons. And that's what we wanna do, right? So exercise increases those levels. Um, it, maintains the, it maintains the integrity of white matter and gray matter. And this is how those neurons talk to each other um, through transmissions through those nerve cells through the synapses. And it increases um, cognitive control or excuse me, enhances cognitive control, but reduces impulsivity and promotes better decision-making and promotes um, your better be able to plan this, that executive functioning of stuff, be able to plan things out, make good decisions um, and quicker, um, quickly. It improves your sleep. Um, so it can help establish a sleep waste cycle if you're having some issues with sleep, which we will talk about um, in depth here in the next couple of weeks. It can ease symptoms of depression and anxiety. It's an automatic kind of mood booster, um, particularly it's that automatic mood booster, mood booster, but if you have it as part of your long-term routine, it can help with those. It's an, an alternative therapy um, for depression and anxiety. And I said weight training and exercise um, help the brain. So they've shown that that's the best combination, but it can help the brain be more flexible because when you're doing both, you're having to cognitively work your brain. So you're doing more cognitive exercises along with those physical exercises. And it increases the neuroplasticity of your brain, um, which is the ability for your brain to be flexible. Um, when you experience and learn and challenge your brain, um, you're creating more reserve for your brain to use as it might need it. So there's more reserve for the brain to pull from as it might need it. And of course, all exercise um, reduces your risk for any cardiovascular issues. So quickly, these are just some research on exercise and they do a lot of research on exercise for people that um, don't have dementia, but also people that do have dementia and study after study has been showing that those that already have a dementia diagnosis of progressive dementia, that exercise really does help maintain where they're at for a longer period of time. So it can look like it slows the progression of the disease, what it looks like if they're practicing or um, implementing regular exercise throughout um, their days. But I'll say um, the, that third bullet point, the Northeastern University, <clears throat> six months of exercise produced visible function changes in the brain. So they could actually see the brain changing uh, through MRIs or PET scans. Um, they could see physical changes in the brain. Even those who began to see cognitive decline showed improvements as they became more active. So not only were they able to function better, but they could see the changes of the brain um, through those scans that they were having. So I think there's really no reason to not exercise. Um, so how much exercise? This is always the question. Um, most studies recommend or advise for 30 minutes of moderate physical exercise most days of the week. So about five days of the week. Or if you can get 150 minutes a week. And I underlined moderate physical activity because you do, and this is where you want to talk to a doctor. As we get older, our heart, um, the walls of the heart become a little bit weaker. So we don't want to overstress the heart if we're doing high intensity exercise. So you want to be in that comfortable, moderate physical exercise. But what is that level for you? Um, you want to talk to the doctor and work with the doctor about that. Um, so doubling this amount, you know, if you do even more. You know, if you're doing 300 minutes of exercise a week, um, that may give your brain even more benefits. Um, but some studies suggest the length of the individual exercise matters as well. So some, some studies say the best benefits come in exercise sessions that last 45 to 60 minutes. If that seems too daunting, um, or if even a 30 to 60 minute session seems too daunting, add five to 10 minutes each week until you reach your goal. So let's say you start at five minutes, and for five days out of that week, you exercise for five minutes and then you add a couple of minutes or add five minutes each week um, until you work your way up. And then with exercise, you do have to work your way up to a goal. You're not just going to go out and be exactly where you want to be and as fast as you want to be. You have to work your way up. 
Um, but I, you know, what I kind of prescribe to is really, yes, exercise is important. You want to get your heart rate up to a certain standard or to that, that moderate physical um, level, but really incorporating out more movement throughout the day. Um, and they are showing that you can exercise and you can maybe, let's say you swim every day and you swim for 30 minutes to 45 minutes every day. Maybe you garden as well. You're pretty physically, actually, uh, physically active for up to an hour, to an hour and a half a day. But if the rest of the day you're sedentary and you're sitting at on your couch or you're commuting and you're in the car all day, you're sitting behind a computer, that sedentary time um, can offset the benefits of that physical activity. So while we do want to incorporate physical activity, exercise, you also have to be very aware of how much more are you moving throughout the day. So do you park at the back of the parking lot at the grocery store and walk all the way, you know, cover that parking lot? Are you um, up and about moving throughout the day? Instead of sitting, you know, every hour you have an alarm that goes off to remind you to walk around for a little bit. Um, because it's more movement throughout the day because we don't want to offset that physical activity we've already um, incorporated into our day. And just some exercises, types of exercise that you can try. Um, you don't have to automatically go out and run. I know a lot of people don't want to go run or go swim, um, but you can jog, you can ride a bike, you can um, uh, garden, I said, swimming, hiking, dancing. Um, dancing has been one of the most uh, in, I guess most studied physical activities, but also um, mo emotional, social, and um, cognitive activities that are best for most human beings because you're getting so much um, benefits of these brain influencers all in advance, um, advanced session. You can climb stairs, you can play sports, um, you can mow the lawn, just getting out and moving. Anything that gets your heart to beat, um, it's beating harder, you sweat a little bit, um, and it's hard for you to have a conversation with somebody. Mm -hmm. um, so it's got to be a little bit, well, I don't want to talk to you. Quit talking to me. I can't talk to you. One of those. And then adding that strength resistance um, in there. And that can be if you have free weights around. Um, that can be those resistant bands that you have. It can be getting cans of food. It could be also be just resistance of your body weight. Um, you know, doing um, push-ups. And you can do push-ups against the wall. You can do squats. You know, just the resistance of your own body can be um, included in a strength training. But then adding in um, some exercises that also help with mind and body. And this is where yoga and chai, uh, tai chi come in. Um, there are a lot of physical benefits to this, to both of these, because you are physically having to be active and it does increase your strength, but it also increases your balance, but it increases your um, breathing. Um, being more mindful of how you're breathing and being more in tune with your body. Um, and it helps with mental relaxation as well. So while maybe the movements are slower in yoga and um, Tai Chi, you're still having the same exercise benefits that moderately, you know, moderate physical exercise, um, but it can help lower that blood pressure, help with maintaining um, a relaxed mind and be more mindful. Um, if you're more aware of your breathing, and how your body's feeling and what works for your body. So with this, they say, if you can do one to two sessions a week, um, that's great. So again, then I'll, an uh, exercise program is just one part of overall fitness because we do want to incorporate that moderate physical activity but aim to get more active overall. Paying attention to that, um, your diet, what you're eating, um, you know, I don't want to exercise and then go eat something unhealthy because that's going to offset the benefits of that exercise, but also how much you're sitting throughout the day too or not moving. But practice safety. Safety is um, number one importance. So talk to that doctor before you start an exercise program or a new diet, um, especially if you're living with an already condition like a, a lung condition or a heart condition or something because you, you have to take special precautions, especially if you're exercising outside in this heat and humidity. Um, we certainly want to take more precautions for that. And then maybe if you want to track your progress, um, results are a measure of success. So maybe you want to just track how, um, how you're feeling overall, maybe concentration levels. It might be you're trying to lose weight or you're trying to increase strength or endurance or balance. What do you want to track if you want to? Again, starting slow, 
Um, there are some cognitive fitness apps that you can use as an initial. Here's my baseline. Um, here I am cognitively at baseline and then retest every six months to see an improvement um, with those. But so I also say don't retest too often because um, you can have um, false results because you can simply learn the test or really are you improving cognitively. And then there are smart apps to help motivate you to set reminders, um, calendars to keep you on track. But motivating and educating yourself and you don't have to use an app. You don't have to use, um, you know, they have those smart watches now. Um, it's what's going to work best for you. If you just want to use pen and paper and mark down, yes, I exercised today. And this is how much I did. And I feel good about myself. It's up to you. But there are some um, other app suggestions there if you want to use those. And just some few um, words of advice. Um, we want to strive for progress, not perfection. Um, and this is with anything in life, right? Um, progress, not perfection. Make small changes and keep adding small changes. Um, we're not going to change everything overnight. It's just small changes and keep adding those small changes as you as you um, success or successful at each small change at a new one. And reward yourself along the way. It's hard um, to change our lifestyle choices and change our lifestyle habits. So reward yourself. Add variety and keep it simple. Develop a plan because life will knock you off your tracks. Um, that's just it's what it's about. <laughs> Sometimes it seems like. Um, life happens and it can knock you off. You um, don't exercise for a couple of weeks and it's hard to get back out there or um, you've had a lot of parties and so that you've eaten not as well, you know, recently. So how am I going to get back on track and know that it's okay um, to, to not exercise for one day or not eat a healthy thing this one day. Um, but how am I going to get back on track? And you want to find exercises and foods that work for you. Mm -hmm. Um, what works for you, again, may not work for your spouse or for your sibling or for your neighbor, but find what works for you and always talk to that trusted doctor. So we are, um, next week, we will talk about sleep and stress. So really dive deep into those two areas of brain um, or influences of our brain health. I think we have just a couple of minutes, really. If anybody has any questions or comments or suggestions, maybe some exercises or diets or foods that they found helpful. Well, Jamie, the um, intermittent fasting and keto diets are very popular right now. And um, many of you know that that is something that I've done over the last two years and was able to lose um, 108 pounds doing intermittent fasting and keto and reverse to diabetes. So it can be done even in postmenopausal women. Uh, it can sure seem like it is um, impossible when you get started, but I was listening to what Jamie was saying there at the end. It really is. If you, my, what my doctor suggested to me is, can you do it for 30 days? Can you commit to 30 days? Well, then it was a challenge. Um, yeah, I can do anything for 30 days. I can do anything for a little while. And then it becomes a habit because habits are formed and we break bad habits if we'll commit for 28 to 30 days. To either stop something or start something. That's how you break a habit. So I encourage you one thing. If it is um, increased water, 30 days, um, something uh, exercising. 30 days. And then, it, and then you, I hate to say it, you miss it when you don't do it. Boy, that I never thought I'd say that. So <laughs> doesn't seem like it goes, does it? Really? No. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Holly. So that reminds me on my um, refrigerator, I have a little saying, it says, you didn't come this far to only come this far. And I see that and I was like, oh, fine. I'll close good. it. That's good. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, and then, that. that's good. Yeah, you only, yeah. Um, and one other thing that, because uh, I get asked this a lot, and again, talk to your doctor, but some people will say, well, what's the best time to exercise? Because I always remember this. And the best answer I've ever heard is said, the best time to exercise is when you are going to exercise. So don't say, well, I didn't get up early enough to exercise, so I'll just start again tomorrow. Um, well, 
try. <laughs> When's the best time that you're going to exercise? That's the best time to exercise. So, anybody have anything else? Well, we will send out the slides in the recording this afternoon along with our upcoming programs. And hopefully, so next week we'll see you back and we'll talk about stress and sleep. Mm -hmm. Thanks, everyone.